And welcome to the All News That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Today, I've got Lee Kearney with me. He is the founder and CEO of Spin Companies and learn more at spinhouses.com. He is an accomplished real estate investor in all things real estate involved in tens of thousands of different uh, deals. And I myself have sold him hundreds of homes myself in my real estate business. And Lee, welcome to the program today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I make no bones about this. I, I started real estate 2007. I've said this many times. I've seen a lot of real estate investors come and go through the years. Lee has been there since, two, actually, he, I think he started in 2004, but I remember in 2007 working with him, still there to this day, and you've amassed a, you know, a tremendous brand. How have you been able to outlast all these others, all these other come and go investors? You got to be able to move, move with the market. And, you know, you and I are having a discussion before we get on the show. Initially, it, the game was trying to move with the market as the market changed, but now with technology and with how fast things are moving, not only do you have to be able to move with the market and change your strategy, you've got to be able to predict the market, get six months or ahead of things, be the first person out of the gate, and that maximize the opportunity before the, the crowd catches up. So that's really what I've been working on the last couple of years. It's what's the next thing? Where's the next opportunity? Where's the market going? And then completely flipping our strategy on its head and going exactly where the opportunity is. You know, I don't define myself saying, well, this is what I buy, or this is, I only rehab houses, or I only wholesale, or I only buy in Florida. No, I go where the opportunity is. One of the opportunities, just to give you an example today that's presented itself over the last several months, is buying stuff in a lot of these cheap markets because we've, we've got really good uh, relationships with a lot of asset managers, a lot of different buying sources. So I'm going, I'm, I'm following the source and the source has deals in Ohio, I'm buying deals in Ohio. So we're buying a lot of houses out of state, we're buying a lot of stuff all over the country. If it makes sense, we'll do the deal. And we're not just boxing ourselves in and, and defining ourselves by a very narrow strategy. Right. And you began probably just like any other real estate investor, you found a house in a multiple listing service and you flipped it. Uh, today, though, you're working with, you know, you're going to the source, to the asset managers, to the pools, to the auctions. I mean, you're very, very, very far beyond just buying homes out of the multiple listing service. And that's one of the tricks I know to survive as a real estate investor. You've got to go to the source of these, uh, these, uh, these assets and everything. How are you able to amass those types of relationships? Consistency, you have to be consistent. You have to make uh, one of your non-negotiables in business that you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. And I really, really stand by that because there's so many people, as you know, Jamie, in this, in this business, especially in real estate, they see the dollar signs, they see the big trades, they see the 10, 20 grand deals. And so it attracts a lot of the wrong kind of people. Right. And I don't know, and I actually I do know this about you. You get burnt a couple of times by someone who says they're gonna do something and they don't do it. Yeah that puts a big distance between you. Now, the people that win in this business are the ones that say, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna follow through, and they do that consistently. So I've always tried to make that part of who I am, inside business, outside business, and make sure that if I say I'm gonna do something, that's exactly what I do. Yeah, and that's what sets you apart from the other real estate investors uh, through the years is one of the big problems we have with, you know, bank owned properties, investors tie them up. They try to, you know, flip them or resell them during their contract period. If they can't find a buyer, they cancel on you. Lee said, if I'm under contract, <clears throat> I'm closing with you. And you never did. You never canceled anything from the time that you went under contract, at least not with me. And that was something that, you know, really stood out for me. And I don't think any other investor put that on the table the way you did. Well, and that's because, you know, a lot of people in business just look at it as a dollars and cents equation. I look at business as putting people first and relationships first, and then the money follows. Now, obviously, you don't invest all of your time into the wrong people, but if you're working with the right people, good people that have good business going, and you strike up those relationships with those people, that can produce millions of dollars. Again, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. When I look back over the last several years and I look at the millions of dollars that have been made, a lot of that, a big, big percentage of that has come from very, very specific relationships. And not like 10 or 20 or 30 different relationships, like five or 10, actually probably less than that, probably like five or six relationships that are really where I've done hundreds of deals with one person or I produce it or pursued a particular source and teamed up with a particular partner on that. And we did like a thousand deals. I mean, it's just been that kind of scale where you find the right people in the right place the right strategy the right business the right product and you, you just really maximize that opportunity so it but it goes back to being making that who you are i can't make someone be ethical i can't make someone do what they say they're going to do 
you have to make that a part of who you are. And I made a decision when I started in real estate, that's the kind of person I was going to be in business. Now, I remember you telling me a story uh, one time about your uh, how you got into real estate. Uh, you needed to make some money. You thought, well, I could go get a job or I go flip a house. Tell me, tell me about how you got into real estate. Well, it even goes back one step further before that. That was my first purposeful rehab. The one before that, I'd actually bought a condo. It was a penthouse in Ireland where I was living at the time. This was back in 2003. Penthouse, thought this was great. It's pre-construction. Moved in. Within a couple of weeks, it got broken into. It ends up, they, they were renting out. This is back in Ireland. They, they, they like to admit social housing and private housing. So I had government tenants around me. It ends up being the place turned really rough really quick. So I got broken into, there was people running up and down the hallway all hours of the night. So I was like, I can't live here. So I put it right back in the market. and I sold it three months later. I think I made 30,000 euro at the time. <laughs> did, you, did you fix it up at least or did you sell it as is? As is. So <laughs> I made about $40,000. $40, I'm like, well, what does the heck just happened here? I made more money <laughs> on this accidental flip. I didn't even really know I was flipping the place. It wasn't even my intention. I made more money in that deal than I had in my job. And so that's for me back in 2003, that's where the light bulb went off. So I was coming back to the States and, you know, I'm on a student visa at the time. I was an Irish citizen. I, I couldn't uh, work per se. So I was like, well, I can invest. I can buy a property and sell it. You know, if I did it by accident, surely if I do it on purpose, I can make some money. So the good news is the California market was ripe in 2004. It was still going well. It didn't really start to crash until the end of like 05 about a year maybe before Florida started to its decline. And I found a mentor. And for everyone out there, I'm telling you, if you want the path of least resistance, this is another big reason why you should invest in people. Because my mentors, I always gave first, I'm like, how can I help you? If a guy was fixing up the house and I want to learn from him, like, can I help you work in one of your houses? Can I follow you around? Can I provide some value to you? And I actually meant that. And so the mentors that I've picked up in my life, I've always tried to give something to them first before asking for something in return. And that's proved to be a very, very profitable thing, not only in business, but in relationships outside of business and just really making friendships and relationships that last. And so I found a mentor out in California and kind of shadowed him around, watched what he was doing and asked a lot of questions and you know, really just try to understand his business. So he kind of really helped me narrow in what kind of house to buy, what kind of area, what kind of price point, what kind of repairs to do, because I had no idea. So anyway, got this house as a probate deal, hired yeah, and this old agent that had been doing this for 50 years. But anyway, she was able to locate a probate deal. It took four months, Jamie, four months to buy that first house. I mean, I drove probably 200 homes in those four months, just huh. driving, driving. I knew it just wasn't the right house. You got to remember, this is my first actual investment. Right. A lot of my own cash. I was going to be borrowing the rest of the money privately. I couldn't lose. So I found the deal, bought it for about 130000 It was in the complete like hood in San Bernardino. I mean, it was bad. Right. I, had, I had a gang member next door, a <laughs> sheriff across the street, just a really mixed bag neighborhood. Somehow, after like electrocuting myself and plumbing leaks and all <laughs> sorts of things, I'm trying to rehab this thing myself. I ended up flipping the house, made about thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars. In fact, outside my office, uh, just outside the door, I've got that first deal posted. You know, uh -huh. bought it for one thirty, sold it for one eighty-five. It made about thirty, thirty-five thousand after all expenses. Mm -hmm. So now I'm feeling pretty good. Did my second deal. Now the market's starting to slide the other way in California, and simultaneously I moved back to Florida. So what I did was I actually uh, tried to rehab the house from Florida. And that was one of my first big mistakes. So I'll say to anyone, if you're buying a house, not in a market where you're at, where you can go there and look at the project on a regular basis. So again, I stumbled through that project, but I didn't make 35 grand. I think I made 10, 12 grand and I was happy. With that. So you bought your, your first house in Florida while you were in California still? Did I get that right? My first house in California when I lived out there, bought my second one in California. Okay. Moved back to Florida and was still trying to rehab the house in California from Florida. Oh, okay. So you knew you needed to focus on Florida at that point then. Right. And then I hired a friend. And that's another second mistake. So remote rehabbing and hiring your friends, two bad moves, things I don't do anymore. Right, right. Yeah, you, if you want to ruin a relationship or watch a relationship go up in flames, hire your friend as a contractor. <laughs> that's the best way. If you will want to just decimate a relationship. Right. So anyway. Uh, moving forward, moved to Florida. Again, 
look for a mentor. I was like, well, it worked once. So I asked everyone I knew, it's like, how do I make money in real estate? One of my friend's fathers said, go to the foreclosure auctions. So I walked my butt down there, started looking at the auctions, watched people, it was like a used car salesman uh, conference. It was basically the best way I could describe it. It's crazy, it's like talk about swimming with the sharks. I was watching deals happening, case numbers being called out. I had no idea. Anyway, jumped in after about two weeks, bought my first house, ended up flipping that one, made about 40 grand, did about six or seven deals in 2005, did about 25 deals in 2006, about 50 deals in 2007, lost it all. No, Market wow. crashed, made about $2 million, lost $2 million. I was flat broke. So at the end of 2007, beginning 2008, I didn't have like nothing. Like I'm down to like maybe 20, 30 grand yeah. from two million dollars. So that's actually when I started wholesaling. And my first year wholesaling in 08, I went up to 100 deals in that first year. And now I've been doing on average 30, 40, 50 deals a month consistently for years. So buying about five, six, selling the same amount. So it's been quite a journey, like really a roller coaster. And you've got offices in Miami and Tampa, and you're also educating other people today on how to do what you're doing. We'll cover that when we uh, come back from the break. Absolutely. Currently talking to uh, Lee Kearney, owner and CEO of Spin Companies. Learn more at spinhouses.com. Learn more about this program at thatbusinessnetwork.com, where new shows air each weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And find us all across social media, facebook.com forward slash that business show. Also, our Twitter handle is at that biz show. We'll be back in a moment. And welcome back to That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Today, we're talking with accomplished real estate investor, Ali Kearney. Learn more at spinhouses.com. He's been involved in tens of thousands of uh, real estate deals and definitely knows real estate investing better than anybody that I have ever personally met. So, Lee, 2007, you said you lost nearly all your money. You're down to the last 20000 And for you, that's, that's a low amount of money. For others, that might be, well, that's a hell of a lot of money for me. Well, <laughs> Nonetheless, for a real estate investor, that's not good. Yeah. Two dollars. That was a big drop off. I went from being a multimillionaire in my twenties to basically being back to zero. First off, how do you adjust your mindset to deal with that? Because rising to the top and then falling, I mean, it's almost like I just had rather just stayed down along the bottom all that time because falling from such a peak, just how did that impact you mentally? It was tough. I think it was about two weeks and I'm not a depressed person. I don't suffer from depression, but I was truly depressed for about two weeks. It was hard to get out of bed. It was hard to just figure out like, how did this happen? But what I did in those two weeks, I said, what happened? What went wrong? And I really spent time with myself figuring out where did I go wrong? And the big place I went wrong, which is the big thing I preach now, I wasn't looking what was going on around me. I was so busy rehabbing these houses, trying to get them done quickly, get them done on budget, that I didn't pop up my head and look around at the market and say, oh, the market's crumbling before my eyes. So I say to everybody, you do need to be focused on your business, but you also need to pop up your head outside of your business and actually look at the market. And especially in real estate, because things do change, because real estate goes through cycles. Now, actually, I would even go beyond real estate. Most businesses go through cycles. People just don't realize that, but they do. You got a growth stage, you got a mature stage, and then places like you know, Blockbuster, for instance, they're just gone. Basically, they get phased out. So, you know, you've got to really be paying attention to what's going on in the market. Is your strategy being phased out? Are you in the mature stage of your strategy? Are you in the, the, the growth stage where you should be maximizing buying everything in sight? You know, people a lot of times are just going down the path and not paying attention to what's going on around them. So one right. of the big lessons I've learned, you look ahead and you make corrections now so you don't get caught with your pants down when things do change. And if you've got a great opportunity and you can 100 exit or 1,000 exit, that's what you do. When the opportunity is there, you go down full throttle. That's how you make money. Now, at that time, our market in Tampa Bay lost about 50% of its value. So let me ask you, you had $2 million or so in the bank. How is it that you lost $2 million? Was it the values dropped out from underneath of it? And then why just not let them go to foreclosure and keep your cash? Why, how did you actually lose all that cash? 
Sure. I actually reinvested every dollar back into real estate. So what had happened was I'm now, let's just take a house I bought for a hundred, put 40 grand into it and I'm selling it for 80. Right. So my cash that was in the deal went to the deals basically. Okay, so you had your own cash inside these deals in the rehab. So it wasn't a matter you just let it go to foreclosure and it's the bank's money. Yeah, I reinvested because I was doing so well in real estate. I basically reinvested everything back into real estate. So how did you get back on your feet? Did you did you burn any lenders? Did you because those relationships are key to your business? How did you protect those relationships? I paid every one of those guys off. Those private lenders all got paid because I knew that the market was going to bounce back. I want to burn any bridges. So I was bringing 20, 30, 40, 50 grand to closing. It was depressing. Right. I was bringing money to closing just to get deals closed. Wow. But I was able to, to skate out and get back to zero because I chose the hard way on purpose. I didn't want to do it the easy way because by doing it the hard way, I preserved my reputation. Yeah, but you protected again, you know, those relationships with those lenders. And today, with as much volume that you're doing, I mean, you've got to have you know cash on demand. Basically, you can't be you can't be applying for mortgages in your business. You've got to be you know making a call. I need this. Okay, here you go. That's how it works in your business today. Yeah, if you, if you buy something the option today, you need money today. That's not a bank. That that's a phone call to a private lender. Right. And I've got I've got a dozen of those on the speed dial at this point. Because right. Because consistent in making payments doing what I say I'm going to do and turning the deals and executing on what I've said I was going to do. So anyway, uh, so as far as making money, how did I get back? Well, I looked at, looked at the market and I said, what's going on in 2008? Bank owned properties. So then I said, okay, well, that's where the biggest volume is, right? That's what the market's giving. Where are the bank owned properties? Where were the bank owned properties back in 2008? The MLS. So I focused 100% of my effort I'm buying bank owned properties from the MLS. And as I get into this, I said, okay, how can I create money? I know that the opportunity is bank owned properties. I know that the opportunity is the MLS. So, so how can I profit from that? What I realized was I was competing against a whole bunch of guys, and you know, you know this, Jamie, a whole bunch of guys that were one man operations, operating basically out of the trunk of their car. They weren't sophisticated, they didn't have a lot of resources. They weren't consistent, you know, they do their flip and then they go off to, you know, on vacation for a month. Then they come back and do another one. They were just basically spending everything they made. Yeah. And so that was perfect scenario. So I've got a lot of supply, a lot of opportunity, and my competition's not sophisticated. So I swooped in, I said, okay, how can I get these offers in as fast as possible? So you remember this, I was getting offers in in minutes. Yeah. So I, I had it where every single bank owned property in Tampa Bay and in the greater Tampa Bay area that hit the market that met my criteria was emailed to me and then it went straight to a processor who created an offer that was already 90% filled out and then it was it was emailed to you guys. I would say on average, like five minutes I was getting off. You were. Was, and the, what made you stand out is we knew we could trust those offers because there were other people that would send us offers quick, but we knew that they would probably cancel on us. We didn't know the, how strong those offers were. <laughs> And I want to further that point. The reason there was such an opportunity nine years ago, the banks weren't requiring in a lot of cases the listing be held for 10 days. So if we got minute one and minute five my offers in and it, it, it's list price, what could you do? You could pend it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. doors opened, doors closed. I got the deal before pe and people are like, what just happened? Yeah, you automated the offer process before other people learned how to do that. What Absolutely. Is I swooped in and took the deal before you could even go look at the property. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I did was I divided properties into three buckets. And this is how I was able to analyze properties really quickly. Now, so the government's uh, properties, the banks, though, made it tougher on you guys in the coming years, though. They started to put investor restrictions on their purchase restrictions. How were you able to, uh, you know, I wouldn't say manipulate, but how were you able to work through those types of situations? Sure. Well, th there was multiple ways we did that. So the first one, we just had to hold them. Sometimes we would have to hold a property for 90 days. The other way we would do it is, uh, you know, we would, I would work with my attorney and figure out a strategy, like suppose... We couldn't sell for more than 120000 no problem. I put a $30,000 buyer fee on the buyer side, I would, still, I would sell at one hundred and twenty. So I'd make sure to meet those restrictions. So there's the good news is with a real estate transaction or I'd put a large commission due to our brokerage, you know, on, my, on, on the buyer side of the HUD. So they would have to pay my commission. So there's lots of ways within reason that you could do these things where you weren't selling a property for more than what the restrictions were. But if you looked at the restrictions, 
there was there was always a way to get the deal done. And I've always had the philosophy, if I've got a property at X and I've got a buyer at Y that's more money, I'm gonna find a way to make that deal work. And I did, and I pioneered a lot of the strategies that were being used. And so, I mean, you can sell your company. You know, let's just say you can't sell the property. Buy it in a company name, sell the company. You can do that. Now there's not even a real estate transaction. See, that's, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So Buy where is... Sell- Where's the uh, opportunities today? I don't want you necessarily to give out all your secrets or anything, but you know, where are you making your monies today? Is it in the off-market deals, the, uh, the, the, yeah, uh, the, the auctions? Am, what? It's interesting you mention that. In most cases, because of technology primarily, as well as competition, the stuff that's on market, and I say that whether it's an auction platform, it's foreclosure platform, the MLS, a pro, even probate, something that's publicly available. Any list that's publicly produced is pretty much played out. So what I've done is I've engaged a lot of my old strategies, which is looking for anomalies in the market, weird stuff. I call it outside the auction. So I'll find a deal where I can see that there's a legal anomaly or I can see a situation that where I, I have knowledge of title or, and legal issues where I can you know, buy the property, let's just say before it goes to auction. So we picked off a deal about three weeks ago. It was a multi-parcel deal. It was a singular final judgment but it encumbered several properties. I actually, so I approached the bank and I said, listen, I wanna buy your position. So I purchased the judgment. Now I control the paper. Now I'm working with the borrower and I'm working on trying to get a deed to the property because I know the buyer's situation, he's in financial trouble, I need to get it. He's gonna give me a deed because I'm gonna give him money. Then at that point, now I control the deed, I control the paper, property never went to auction. I was going to ask about the mortgage notes and that whole business because I know years ago there was a you know a database that the National Area Brokers Association was pushing out to try to get people into this because there's no real central point to get like you know mortgage notes but is that a lucrative business for people to understand that? Well, the whole idea there is that you're going upstream. So basically, you know, if you can't get it on the market, you go off market. If you can't get the asset off market, then you buy the paper. And it's all about going upstream, and that's what investors are doing. So they chase deals upstream until there's no more opportunity. And even at the notes section, I've watched notes, I mean, at the low point in 2008 when the, when the market crumbled, I bought my best deal was a $120,000 first mortgage I bought for 2,500 bucks. So what's that like, two and a half cents in the dollar? Yeah. I mean, crazy. But and I've, I've watched and I bought a whole package of notes uh, from a nonprofit that, that likes to give out houses and then for, not foreclose them, they'll remain unnamed. So I got that for about 30 cents in the dollar, but now I'm seeing notes even go for 60, 70, 80 cents in the dollar, just bunk, like numbers that just don't make sense. So I see the deals being chased all the way upstream and that's why I'm focused on stuff that's off market, that's weird, stuff that other people aren't buying, stuff that other people aren't chasing. So a lot of cases I'm competing against myself. So yeah, if I call up a bank on a, a note, no one else is buying and I'm the only bidder, I get it for my price. And so I've had a lot of success lately by chasing stuff that people aren't going after and just really doing a little extra research to uncover things that other people wouldn't readily see. So yeah, because they haven't made note buying easy yet. There's no database to go to to find them all. I mean, you just got to work the phones, right? Yeah, you've got what's well, really relationships. And I'll tell you, if you can buy 100 notes at once, it goes back to my strategy, you can make some money. But you know, just like buying one note, like buying one asset, you know, you're gonna have limited results. But if you can buy a good package of stuff that, that's overall a, a good deal, you can make a lot of money. And so I've really tried to, you know, 10X, 100X, 1000X the ideas that work really well. But notes are definitely a, a more advanced strategy and I wouldn't recommend those to someone just getting into real estate. And today you're giving back uh, through education. I, I, I see you running a, a Facebook ad for one. And you're sitting around six different monitors. That's how much business he's got. He's got six, oh, yeah. six monitors around him. Talk to me about your education that you do. Yeah, uh, uh, go to 5030experience.com. That's 5030experience.com. We teach everything from doing your first deal. We got a quick start program, which is teaching you how to do, get your first five-figure paycheck in five weeks. Then we also teach a more advanced program, which is a seven-figure masterclass. And you have to actually qualify for that. So if you haven't done X amount of deals and you're not already operating the business, we actually will deny you from the class. And so I've got a group of upper level students there and I take them from doing, you know, five figures a month to six figures a month. And so, and the goal is to turn them into seven figure operators on a yearly basis. So we've had really good success, both with our new students that have never done a deal, actually getting their first deal and more done. 
and then we've had really huge success with our operators that are operating at this level and really show them how to raise the bar in their business. So it's it's been really rewarding. Nah. Great, great business. And we got about a minute left. I mean, I've seen you go through such a growth and development in real estate that you've now branched out into the restaurant business. You're involved with a mini donut factory. Tell us yeah. about this real quick. Yeah, yeah. Patrick and Z are just wonderful people. I remember the first day I walked in, I saw the store, I saw the product, I smelled the product, I tasted the product. <laughs> and I said to Patrick, I said, I love this place. He said, I love it. He said, I love it. I'd love to be a part of it. And we danced the dance for several months. And finally, we were able to strike a deal that the thought was good, I thought was good, and uh, actually brought in another one of my friends. Um, and so in the background, you know, I've invested in that business. Patrick and Z are the operators and do a fantastic job. I mean, his marketing, second to none. And that's the thing, what, we, what we've done with the Mini Donor Factory is we made it an experience, a Tampa thing. It's very difficult to compete with an experience or something that's part of the community. That's what I love about it. Yeah. And now, actually, we're on that note, we're opening our St. Pete store, which should be opening in September. Fingers crossed. We're down to the wire on that one. So uh, and we'll be opening several more locations in the Bay Area. So it's really super exciting business. I like it uh, because it's it's a feel-good business. It's not just about flipping a house. It's it's about you know being part of the community and really providing experience for people. So I, I definitely love that business. All right. Lee Kearney, owner and CEO of Spin Companies, thank you so much and congratulations on all your success in business. Thanks, Jamie. And to learn more, spinhouses.com and for educational uh, resource, 5030experience.com, 5030experience.com. You've been listening to That Business Show 2.0. I'm your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business.